Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Big Game Indicating Dogs live Q&A. These live Q&As are held in the Big Game Indicating Dogs Inner Circle. And the Big Game Indicating Dogs Inner Circle is a closed Facebook group where people that are following the Deer Dog Training Blueprint can post and ask questions and talk amongst themselves. It's a bit of a supportive community there. We've got a lot of really good members in there now and people are asking questions and members are answering them and it's quite a cool closed forum. And we hold these live Q&As in there for people who are following the Deer Dog Training Blueprint. And the Deer Dog Training Blueprint is a 12-part month by month 15 hour video series with everything you need to train your own deer dog whether you're starting out with a young pup or retraining an older dog it has everything you need you can find out more about the deer dog training blueprint and big game indicating dogs at biggameindicatingdogs.com and you can also follow us on facebook instagram and youtube all of these videos are posted on our public facebook and youtube after we hold them live in the inner circle and we also post the audio to these Q&As on the Paul Michaels Revolution podcast so you can go to the app store or google podcast apps download a free podcast app open that app up search the Paul Michaels Revolution and you can listen to the audio for all of these Q&As and a whole bunch of other stuff that's on the Paul Michaels Revolution podcast we have some interesting guests in. We do a whole heap of these dog training Q&As. We do Palmico dog training Q&As, which is general dog training, just helping people to have a well-trained dog with no bad habits that's fun and easy to have around. That's Palmico dog training. You can find out more about Palmico dog training on Palmico dog training on Facebook and Instagram. And there's a whole bunch of stuff at those places. So, the Q&A. We screwed up our dates a bit on this one. We had to change it from next weekend to this weekend. There's been a heap of posts in the Big Game Indicating Dogs Inner Circle. I've been keeping an eye on them. And the members in there, we've got... Uh, almost 300 members in the inner circle now and a lot of the members in the big game indicating dogs inner circle are there's some really experienced hunters in there Um, lots of people that have trained big game indicating dogs with the blueprint and everyone's starting to do a really good job of answering each other's questions which is really good to see So I'm going to start on this post before we do a QA. and a I always put a post in the inner circle saying there's a QA and a coming up and you can ask your questions in the comments on that post and I'll answer them for you if you can't attend the Q&A live. So Ryan Hart is saying he's still having some issues with Flint in the truck and is whimpering and whining. Long journeys over 20 minutes to a couple of hours, he manages to settle well. But the short journeys around town, going to training, work, etc., 10 to 20 minutes, he just won't settle. Water doesn't seem to do it anymore. He's trying the old giving him a squirt with water to quieten him down. Just running it past you on your thoughts, perhaps an e-collar to try to snap him out of it. He's almost six months now. He's bloody young, man. He's still really young. <clears throat> I know what this is, by the way. Or, yeah. Um, he's almost six months now. He's worried if he leaves it any longer, it's going to become a permanent issue. Cheers. Other than that, his training is going sweet and on the right path. Okay, man. So, he's... Hey, just actually throw there's we've got a few people listening now so just throw a comment up letting me know the sounds all good guys that'd be cool jeremiah how's it going mate there's some people um joining the live chat here just refresh this 
you just throw a comment up um, zero my let me know if the sounds good oh, yeah, all good that's good mate sweet um, yeah so Ryan Hart with this thing with his dog whimpering in the truck on short trips I have a confession to make <laughs> um, print and fly have started to do that since I've been living in town and I do a very short trip very regularly to an area where I take them for a run and it's anticipation and that short trip and they get to recognize the trip and they know where they're going and they're getting excited and <clears throat> this come up in the podcast that we did with um, Julian Payne talking about his dog Seek that he trained on the Deer Dog Training Blueprint and then he got into Retriever training and then he got into doing game bird trials with it. And he got Seek going on the retrieving pretty quick and got into it and was doing really well and then she started breaking. Um, so breaking on the throw, so not being steady to the throw, which is pretty uncool in, in game bird trials, retrieving trials. And the way he fixed that, and it's a very common thing, is not is, is going back out in the training paddock, running retrieves, throwing the retrieve, and not letting her go and pick up every single one. So he'd throw it, and every now and again he'd go and pick it up instead of letting her go and get it. And that's implanting the idea in the dog's mind that, look, every time I throw it, doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to get to run out and pick it up. And now this is just one of these funny things with dogs. Um, there's a few different things like that. Like why do we have to use change of direction to train a dog range? Why can't you think you could just stand on the long line and it'll pick it up? But with the way dogs' brains work, it doesn't work like that. And we have to use change of direction. There's something about it. And if you, when you actually understand and think about the way dogs have um, don't have really strong reasoning um, capability and quite a few different things it makes a lot of sense and and when we're walking forward our body language is telling the dog that we're moving forward so the dog thinks look we're trying to move forward so let's just move forward let's let's go and you can struggle with range and speed and the dog's trying to pull away it's not until you start changing direction that the dog goes oh so just because we're walking in that direction, you know, uh, it doesn't make sense till you start turning. Um, it just doesn't. And you do that change of direction, and it's that same thing. It's telling the dog, just because you're walking in one direction doesn't mean that we're not going to turn around and walk the other way again. And just introducing that idea that we might want to turn around and walk the other way at any time slows the dog right down. All of a sudden, they're looking back at us. Keep an eye on us. We get attended. We get... Um, range and the dog slows down change of direction anyone that's used it in the blueprint um, will know you know and and a lot of people with older dogs that are pulling away or they can't sort out range I show them how to use change of direction properly with the long line because you've got to do it properly too um, and man you can sort out a dog's range real quick and same with the braking on the retrieve if you're letting the dog go for every single retrieve and then you just start throwing it, making the dog wait, and then you go and pick the occasional one up, all of a sudden you've planted the idea in the dog's brain that, okay, just because he throws it doesn't mean I get to run out to pick it up. So all of a sudden the dog's far more relaxed when you throw the retrieve. It's the same psychology is going on here. If every single time we put the dog in the back of the truck, and we drive to this spot which is close and when it's close it's worse because they know where they're going and it's the same thing over and over and over the dog's anticipating it and if it winds just a tiny bit a couple of times and you sort of say ah cut it out cut it out but you keep driving forward it's the same thing as that change of direction and moving forward or throwing the retrieve the dog might be whining you can put pressure on it tell it to shut up but you're still driving to that spot and letting it out then the whole process is working anticipation's building and the dog's like well i whined i might have got told off for it but we still drove around there and he still let me out 
and we still did the played out the session and the whole thing um, snowballs and the dog whines more and more but we keep getting there and letting them out and doing it so and it's a it's a hard one it's a pain in the ass um you know especially when you're busy and um, like print and fly and, and i'll be busy all day and they'll whine and i'll pull over the truck tell them off um yeah they'll, they'll whine a bit and i actually pull over i'm only driving two minutes around the corner but i know if they whine and i still get there and then let them out and take them for a run then they're going to whine next time and it's going to, probably going to get worse and worse um but i don't have time to turn around and go back so i have to go do it and and but i know the only way of fixing that is putting them in the back of the truck if they whine turn around and come home and it's the same as so every time they go in the truck and we drive that way they don't necessarily um get to go for a run um so there's that whole thing that that's my main take on it and yeah you can put an e-collar on and it'll work very well and e-collars can work very well and that's i talked about that before it's the main thing um i don't actually own an e-collar at the moment i've sold i had one for this type of thing for um really bad deeply ingrained barking in the kennel um i've never had to use it on a dog in the back of the truck but i know people who have have had their dogs barking and whining in the back of the truck um and it's been really bad and annoying they haven't been able to fix it they've used the e-collar and it's just stopped it straight away really quickly um e-collars usually work very quickly if you use them properly um, i don't really even want to get into how to use e-collars properly and or telling people how to use it but i'm not going to say no definitely don't use an e-collar if you want to you can if you like um, there's some interesting stuff going on with e-collars worldwide actually it looks like they're about to be completely banned in the uk um, which is interesting but um that's a big part of it and, and yeah print and fly has started doing it as well on the short trip that i do around to the park but if i put them in and i drive past the park and we're just going on a drive where there could be you know a range of different things happening and they don't know where they're going anymore how long it's going to be they're quiet and they're good as gold so um <clears throat> yeah it's a hard one man but yeah, you don't want it to snowball, you know, out of hand and end up with a dog that's always barking in the back of the truck either. Um, maybe that's that's a good way around it. Just um, and I could do that with print and fly too. Is start putting them in the back of the truck when I'm shooting up to the supermarket, and I can drive around past that way, past the um, park to the supermarket and then back home again you know and start mixing it up to me that would be the best way of sorting it out um, without using e-collars doing anything like that yeah the other thing is man six months he's pretty young he is pretty young but i can sympathize with it you don't want it to get out of hand <clears throat> I say, Ryan, he'll just add further info in case he's not watching live. I show zero avoidance to the truck itself. If, if he's not in his crate kennel or on his inside bed, you'll find him sitting next to the truck. Well, yeah, so, yeah, I remember that that's why i took that angle on it's not that he's scared of the truck he's not barking and whining it's all anticipation man um i'd be 99 percent sure anyway jane ash is saying it'd be great if i could hear your thoughts on my post on the 4th of january i will have to go for a scroll Bruce Hampton, hi Paul, I've been doing scent training with Jazz, seven year old Whippet Collie, she finds the skin okay but when it comes to finding a deer that I've just shot she's not really interested, she was beside me 
one time in another time I got her to stay as I stalked in and got a couple. I was about 50, 60 metres away from me, out of sight when I shoot them. Went back and got her. Went back and got her in my pack thinking I can help her onto them because I know where they are. <clears throat> Hunting and shooting deer isn't new to her. I started the blueprint in April 2018. Skipped over a lot of the first parts because she's rock solid, sit, stay. But after watching Blueprint, I trained her too with hand signals and to stop with the hiss. She picked these up in a few days. Getting her to walk in front took a bit longer because when hunting, I've always kept her behind me. Still need to work on her range. Thoughts? Question mark. P.S. I'm all over the podcast. They're great as I don't always get to listen to the live Facebook. That's cool, man. Um... Okay, yeah, a few suggestions there, um, so you're saying shooting deer isn't a new thing to her, but you went in and did something, you put her on a stop, and then snuck forward, shot the deer, then went back and got her and the pack, and then went to find the deer, when you say that, that I'm thinking that might have sparked something, she might you might have said, sit, stay there, stay there. I'm going to go shoot these deer on my own. And she's thought, oh, I'm not meant to, um, you know, have much to do with this. So that's the first thought there. Um, if I had done that with a dog and then after shooting the deer, take her over and she's not paying that much interest, that would have been my first thought. Um, another thing here, um, and I'm actually going to put this as an update in the blueprint. But I've noticed with print, he's been good finding the deer um, after the shot. And, we, you know, that's even in the blueprint there. And he's done some good finds. But he's not as intense as I would like him to be. Really intense wanting to find that down deer after the shot. Um, he said he's quite casual, just tracking it, and he's quite intense looking around for the next one to shoot. He's more interested in finding the next live deer to go shoot another one. And I'm pretty sure I know where this stemmed from too. Where um, in the blueprint, um, in part 11 and 12, and I was hunting over print, we had a couple of days there where we shot more than one deer in a day. And on one particular trip... Um, we shot a couple of seeker. I, I shot a seeker just out of camp, gutted it, hung it up, and then, well, you know, shot it, took print over to it, took him to the kill, everything, gave him a pat, had a talk, did everything, you know, as I normally would, hung that seeker up, and then we snuck a little bit past that and shot another one. And then I brought that one back down and hung that one up next to that first one that I'd shot and then after that for a few days we were I was leaving camp walking past those deer that I'd shot and going out and looking for more deer to shoot you know and um I think we sh I think I shot three deer on that trip and my mate shot a couple too and that's just put a thing in Prince's head that yeah it's, we want to find one and shoot one but after that we really want to look for another one. And I've just noticed it a couple of times when I've shot deer after that. He's taking me to the deer that I've shot. But he's also looking out to the side and up and down and checking the wind. And he's not rock solid looking for that one I've shot. Now, I remember encountering this with Fly doing contract goat control work. Where you're constantly trying to shoot as many animals as you can. And sometimes we'd get into a contact with, with um, you know, a mob of goats. And we're supposed to mark and tail our kills and everything, but you don't want to muck around tailing a goat <clears throat> um, and marking the kill on the GPS while the other ones are getting away. So quite often you get in a contact, shoot a goat, um, walk straight past it, and be shooting other goats. And, and you really had to focus on um, just keeping up with the group, you know. And so Fly started getting very, I'd shoot one, and she's just really intensely looking for the others. 
Um, but then sometimes you wanted to come back and find the ones that you'd already shot and mark them and tail them. Um, so I started, I introduced a command for finding the shot one. Um, and this is what I want to add to the blueprint. And this could, could really help here with dogs that aren't necessarily, that are getting a bit casual with those ones that you've already shot. Or the, you, you might have shot an animal in a group and all the other ones are run away and you're not interested in them and you really want to find that, that shot one. Um, with fly, I just use where is he? Where is he? And it was just another, like all our command, it doesn't matter what you use, you could say coconut bananas. It doesn't matter. Um, but you've just got to choose that one command that sounds different to all your other commands and just stick to it. And you're just associating... Uh, you're linking a, an action with the sound, an action with the command. <clears throat> and I noticed this happening with Fly, that she was becoming more focused on um, finding the next live one so we can shoot another one. And I was going to risk getting to the point where I could start losing ones that I'd shot. Or even worse, I was worried that she was going to completely lose interest in tracking dead deer, you know, or goats. So I started introducing that command and I started doing it with um, goats or deer with the easy ones, same thing, train them on the easy ones so the hard ones are easy. And so if I'd shoot a deer, you know, or, or a goat, might neck shoot a goat right in front of me, bang, and it falls over and it's laying dead on the ground right in front of us and we're both standing there looking at it. <clears throat> and I say to Fly, where is he? Where is he? As we're walking over to it, so I'm linking going to that da that dead deer or that dead goat with where is he? Where is he? And I just started doing that every single time. Every single time we'd we'd shoot a goat and she'd go over to it, I'd say, Where is he? Where is he? And then very quickly I got to the point where um, I could get into a contact with some goats, shoot one or two. And sometimes you'd shoot a couple, start following up the others, and they were they were moving away, and you were getting further and further away from the ones that you wanted to mark and tail. So, or, or, and you might even be spooking those ones that you're pushing. So sometimes you'd actually um, give them a moment to quieten down. I do this with deer sometimes too. If I if I keep bouncing them and spooking them while I'm trapping tracking them, I'll um, just stop for a while and let that animal quieten down. Hopefully it stops, and then follow it up again. But so we shoot a couple of goats, step straight over them, keep following up the the other ones that are still still on their feet, and then I'd turn around and go to come back to find the first goat that I'd shot that was already dead. So I was trying to switch fly from following up on the ones that are still alive to back to the dead ones. And pretty quickly with that where is he command, I could turn around and fly would be wanting, looking back, or you know, having her head up, or checking the wind, looking. You could see she was looking for the live ones, and I'd say, "Where is he?" And she'd know straight away, and she'd remember from the shot and where I'd shot them. And as soon as I go, "Where is he?" She'd just switch and go straight back and find them. And she got really, really good at it too. And um, she got really good at. I could have a contact and shoot two or three goats. Um. And other live ones would be getting away. And I could say, where is he? And she'd go to one and I'd tail that. And if I knew there was another one there, I could say, where is he again? And she'd start tracking around and find it. And, and sometimes you'd spend, um, come back and spend half an hour, you know, over and over finding um, all the goats that you'd shot in thick bush. And she was really good at it. So um, that's a big bit of advice there, Bruce, is, um, is doing that introducing another command for finding that downed deer that's what i'm going to do with print um, and you just do it with association um as the dog as your dog's looking for it to say where is he and if the dog takes you over to the dead one even while you're at the dead one where is he good dog where is he good dog just linking it with praise um yeah and just being careful with things like saying that sit back while you sneak forward, that you're not putting too much pressure on the dog. Um, 
you know what I mean? So the dog's taking in on a deer and then you say, stay there and you go and shoot it. That could be causing something too. And just being aware of that. And maybe that's something for people to keep in mind. We go over that in the blueprint and showing people how to put your dog on a stop, move forward, shoot deer. And we show you how to get your dog steady on the shot and be able to sit and stay while you move right away and make a shot because <clears throat> it is handy to do sometimes but that's one element of that to just keep in mind that you're not planting some seed and maybe it's good to shoot a few deer with your dog out in front with your dog fully engaged with the deer and engaged with the target when you shoot it and then progress to that type of thing later on where you're making your dog stop or you move in and things like that because um, it could just be planting that seed oh he's telling me to stop and stay back when we get close to the deer maybe I'm not meant to um, have anything to do with these things <clears throat> but keep in touch with us on that Bruce let us know if any of that makes sense and it's definitely something um, you'll be interested to get a bit of feedback and sort of hear how it goes for you um, and that's with all of these things same as um, Ryan with that whining thing let us know how you get on Matt Olson, how can I stop a pup drinking salt water at the beach? Commander disapproval doesn't work and makes it hard to take him for a swim. He gets the mean squirts. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to know how old your pup is when you say how to stop a pup drinking salt water at the beach. Commander disapproval doesn't work. Um, yeah, I mean... If this sort of comes right back to principles for me, and we get it a bit, you know, where people, someone will say, I'm working on the dog sit, and it's just not, the, it keeps getting up off the stop, and it's not listening, and I just can't get it. It doesn't necessarily make sense to me, because if we come right back to our principles, and training for success, and not setting a dog up to fail and then and that's where like the long line comes from and techniques like having a pup or dog walking in front dragging a long line <clears throat> giving your stop command standing on the long line half a second later so the dog literally and physically can't walk after it hears that stop command it's automatically stopped by the long line and then we can walk in push the pups bum down pup or dog's bum down as soon as they're relaxed, all the pressure comes off. Now they're on a stop. We step back. If they get up, we say, ah, put them back down, sit them back down. Um, so we're running that stop drill. There's no way that the dog can get it wrong. And we've got all of the tools and techniques to back it up with minimum pressure as well. We don't have to raise our voice. We can just say, you know, print sit. And if he doesn't sit... We can step in and push his bum down. If he doesn't stop, we can stand on the long line. If he tries to move, we can stand on the long line again, walk down the long line and push his bum down. Um, and we also have that idea of training in steps and that also that idea of if you ever find yourself in a position where you're giving your dog a command and it's not listening, then you need to take a step back. You know, so, and, and this is a funny sort of nuanced one or, or you know, um, a little bit unusual, this drinking salt water. Um, and there's lo loads of things to come to mind here, you know, and why is it drinking salt water? Is it, have you been, has it had enough water? Is it too thirsty? Um, all those sorts of things. But that's the first thing. If the dog's in a situation is doing something you don't want it to do, and you're giving it the command of disapproval and it's not listening, then again, another principle, every time you give a dog a command that it's not listening to, or you, every time you give a dog a command and it has the opportunity to not listen to it or it's not listening to it, um, is tr teaching it that it doesn't have to listen to you. you know. And um, how many times has this happened? How does the dog know what you're giving it the command of disapproval for? Probably not. If it's all excited and jumping around the water and drinking water and you're just saying, ah, the dog probably going, what's he on about? You know, so, um, yeah, those that, that's my take on that. And, and the, I mean, for me, if I had a dog that every time I took it near salt water, it started drinking salt water and 
I couldn't stop it. I'd put it on a long line around salt water. And every time it tried to drink salt water, I'd go, ah, and check it. And if it went to drink it again, I'd go, ah, check it. Ah, check it. And then I guarantee you, if you get your timing right and do that properly, you'll see it exactly like in part two of the blueprint, where Prince picking up the long line and trying to play with it. And he goes to pick it up, and I go, ah, and he stops. But he has, he's got no idea why I did that correction and then he goes to pick it up again and I say ah with another check on the long line and he goes what the hell but he still doesn't know why I did it he's like why is this guy I'm just trying I'm just doing a thing here playing with the long line he's not linking the two things and then I do it the third time with perfect timing he goes to pick up the long line again I go ah yank on the long line and he looks up at me again sits there looks back at the long line and goes to lean to pick it up and he goes, oh no, I'm not meant to do that or he's going to give me that that command of disapproval and yank on again and it's done. You know, and then occasionally after that he might try it once once or twice and I'm also linking that command of disapproval with the check on the long line. So, so there's actually that physical touch and consequence getting linked with that up and the timing of it and everything combined together, reading and timing and getting everything right. You know, that's what I'd do. Um, one other thing on this, you know, uh, print and fly don't really do it anymore. Miko does it occasionally at the beach and she'd especially do it more when she's a pup. Um, they're running around the thirsty and they see water and she'd run up and take like two or three licks and then go, oh, that doesn't taste right and stop. You know, so I have seen it. I've never seen a dog that um, consistently drinks salt water over and over to the point where it's, um, you know, giving it the shits. And that's obviously not good. Um, and if I had a dog that was doing that and I was giving it the command of disapproval and it wasn't linking it, I'd put the dog on the long line. And this goes for anything like this too. You know, that's why I use that example of print picking up the long line. Um, had a dog that was drinking salt water. Um, a dog that, as soon as a dog starts getting too excited or, you know, aggressive or anything around other dogs or excited around stock or anything like that, I just put a long line on it and I walk the dog into the situation. I'm setting the dog up to do it again in a situation where I can correct the dog right on the money, like the second it happens. Because you need to make sure that the dog's linking that command and disapproval with the action. And I can do it with anything. Um, you know, like I said, if a dog gets a bit bolshy around cattle and I can see them wanting to jump forward and get a bit, um, wanting to break and chase, then that long line goes straight on and I get them around animals and I calm them down. And if they try to break a chase, I go, ah, check him. You know, and another principle here is, um, man, all pretty much every single time I've seen dogs doing something that I don't want them to do and they keep doing it over and over and I'm trying to correct them. The dog doesn't know that I don't want it to be, to be doing it. And as soon as like, you can communicate with a dog in a way that it can understand that it's actually that that you don't want it to be doing, they just go, okay, and stop. You know, and over and over, like people's dogs pulling on the leash or doing something like that, drinking salt water or um, chasing deer, over and over, breaking and chasing animals, um, being gun shy and, and all of these different things. People think it's easy to think that your dog knows that you don't want it to do it but it just keeps doing it anyway where in my experience as you begin to really understand dogs and read them understand how they think understand dog psychology reading and timing and prop correct training and all of that if a dog's doing something and you're putting pressure on it and it's and it's creating conflict the dog has no idea that you don't want it to be doing that and that it doesn't have to be doing that either. And it's really easy. You can yell at dogs and pull back on the lead, you know, in the Palmico Dog Guide. And this is in a free um, video on Big Game Indicating Dogs on YouTube. I talk about how pulling back on a lead 
the wrong way and yelling at a dog can actually escalate its energy and focus and make it even go after what it's going after even more hard out. So some people, a dog starts getting aggressive towards other dogs and it starts leaning into the leash and the person starts pulling back in the wrong way, just dragging, just like rolling pressure on instead of doing a proper check, instead of going up with the right timing, getting the slack out of the, lo- out of the leash and then correcting the dog when it's relaxed. A lot of people don't even have proper communication and a proper heel and proper leash work and long line work set up properly in the first place which makes it much harder but a lot of the times people are putting a lot of pressure on their dog pulling back on the lead yelling at their dog all this conflict and energy and it's actually hyping the dog up and the dog can it can get in this weird pattern where the dog actually thinks you're hyped up with the other dog as well in the case of a dog being aggressive with another dog um, the dog sees the other dog, gets excited, put, pulls tension on the leash, you pull back harder, start yelling at your dog, you're super tense, and the dog thinks that that's what it's supposed to be doing. And it's the same with breaking and chasing as well. It's very common for dogs to get in a habit of, say, breaking and chasing deer. Um, as soon as it breaks, you're yelling at it. or do, If you haven't got everything set up right previously, that's why it's so important to train properly First, to the point where a dog can carry out its first hunts properly in the way that you want it to do it, then it's very easy to bring a dog back to that default. Then that's the default. If you can have a dog close and steady and steady to the shot, steady to breaking game for its first few deer and shoot a few over it, then if it breaks once or twice later on, you can deal with it and bring it back to that default. But it's very easy to be in a situation where that dog, a dog breaks on a deer, you haven't shown it how to do pro- do it properly in the beforehand, and then it chases the deer, comes, you, you're yelling at it while it's out there running around, comes back to you, you give it a big rack up, it thinks it's getting a rack up for coming back, for stopping chasing the deer, and... Later on that day or on another hunt, it chases the deer again. You yell at it, it comes back. You yell at it again and you're in this vicious cycle where you're like, I go nuts at my dog every time it chases a deer, but he just won't stop doing it. But the dog doesn't know that you don't want it to be doing it. And in a lot of cases, the stuff you're doing to try and tell your dog that you don't want it to be doing it is actually to the dog. The dog's perceiving it as you're telling it to do it. You're adding fuel to the fire. Um, that whole dynamic is very, very common. Jamie, massive comment, all in caps. Stop the whining advice, please. <laughs> um, yeah, I haven't got much context on that. Um, I know we were messaging about it. Um, I'm getting a lot of messages, guys, through Big Game Indicating Dogs on Instagram and Facebook, and some people message my private face. And I've got questions all over the place. Um, And I really need them. That's the whole idea of this post. Um, The live Q&A coming up so all the questions can be in one place. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't mind, you know, you can message and ask questions for sure. Um, but the more we can keep these Q and a questions on the big game, indicating dogs in a circle and on those particular posts, the better. Um, I'll see if I can bring that up. Yeah, I don't know. Um, man, whining, and it can be difficult. It really can. Um, 
and some dogs just have that whining chip you know anytime you're just sitting there and they just want to be doing something they're a high energy dog um print had it a little bit you know even when i was training him to um early on in the blueprint to come inside and lay down and just chill out he'd just be sitting there looking he wouldn't relax and he'd just be sitting there looking at you wanting to go and do something and he'd just do this really quiet um whine and it's one of those annoying things <clears throat> you just have to keep putting pressure on it and try to be very consistent and when they do it they start whining just up ah! and correct the very first one another big one there is really trying to eliminate the situation so if Digby's getting in a situation if he's um you're trying to get him to sit somewhere and relax and do something and he can't do it without whining then take him out of that situation he's not ready to sit quietly and relax in that situation put him out around the corner that's why in crating getting crating and kenneling set up properly right from the start so important um just separate him put him out somewhere where he can um relax and be quiet actually i'm remembering a couple of things now jamie from when we were talking and via message um something about the only time he won't whine in his kennel, that he's still been whining in his kennel, is something about that you put him in a small crate and he stops. Um, then it's putting him as much time as you can in a small crate where he is quiet and as little time as possible in those situations where he does whine. You know, it's about, um, you know, back to the principles. Put pressure on what you don't want, praise on what you do want. So anytime he does it, put pressure on him and putting and correcting that very first whine. Don't let him whine quietly for a while and you're sitting there doing something busy, tuning it out. And then when he gets really loud and you finally get sick of it, go cut it out, Digby. When he's been whining for, you know, super quietly for quite a while. And that can be a big one with that whining. Sometimes they'll sit there and you can almost barely hear it. Um, and you can also come back to that principle of correcting the thought on this one. Sometimes that whining will start with the dog. You tell him to sit, lay down, and instead of just relaxing and looking the other way and looking out the window or just looking around, eventually laying down and going to sleep, they're just staring at you with this intense look on their face. You can correct that. I used to do that with print and he'd sit up and have a bit of a wriggle and like line me up and be staring at me and I knew he was about to start whining and as soon as he started eyeballing me I'd say cut it out and he'd look away and that same timing thing and then making sure you're linking what you want the dog to stop doing with that command of disapproval so print would look away I did this with my Labrador Tessa she used to stare at me while I was eating and start drooling and then she'd start wriggle closer and look at me even more intensely and start drooling more and it just snowboarded and got more annoying and more annoying so i actually started and i did it with print with this whining thing i was correcting them when they actually looked at me because that's when that's when that thought correcting the thought that's when that thought first comes into their head tessa would be just chilling out relaxing and i'll go get some food you know she was a labrador it's a classic labrador thing with the food I'd get some food, start eating, and she'd stop what she was doing or, or stop sleeping and get up and just stare at me. And I started correcting that, get out of it. And she'd look away. And then she'd slowly look back. And as soon as her, she made eye contact with me, I'd say, ah, get out of it. And she'd look away. And I did that really, really consistently. Then that's the key. If you sort of let them do it quite a bit, and then you try to correct it occasionally, you don't make any progress you got to be super consistent really try to eliminate the situation where it's happening and be super super consistent with correcting it um so in that case you know with tessa or print if i knew i didn't have time to sit with them and correct it properly when he did it then he just went outside in a kennel and in your case, Jamie, if I was in a situation where Digby wasn't going to settle down, but he was quiet in a smaller crate in his kennel, I'll just put him in his crate in the kennel. You know, and, and then when I do have time to work with it and correct it, um, I'd take him out of his crate and try to work on it there. If there was a situation that he was whining in, I'd keep him out of that situation if I didn't have time to deal with it 
and I'd choose times to actually set him up and go, right, I'm going to um, deal with this properly now and um, bring him into the situation, sit him down and, and work on it, work on it properly. You know, so you've got to be super consistent with these things. Um, Luke, Ida is nine weeks old, so only eight days into the blueprint and doing really well so far. I take her for a real short training session first thing in the morning, just practicing recall command, then back in the kennel. Says he has a problem finding low distraction space for her. We have free range animals around cats, chickens, ducks, etc. that we can't stop coming into the dog proof area. So I just put her on the long line and take her for a real chill 20 or 30 minute walk. Yep, that's good. With no commands and I do this maybe three times a day. Just checking on your thoughts on this as I kind of feel like I'm just following her around and she's not paying any attention to me. Don't want to set her up to fail, but also aware that she's still so young and is keen to explore this section a little. Keen to hear your thoughts on free time, handing on the long line on this. You know, that's, that's good. So you're saying... Um, you can take her for a real... Yeah, and, and again, she's super young, nine weeks old. So at nine weeks old in the blueprint, we're really just... Um, doing super light training it's not even training we're just linking actions to commands we're not working on compliance work in that first month at all um even in the in the second month we we're you know when our pup's three months old we're still only doing super light um training but in that first month it's just cruising with the pup creating a bond trying to link a few sounds with actions uh, or linking actions to commands and that's about it. And, and Luke's saying he's in a situation where he's struggling to give the pup free time in a good dog-proof area. There's cats and chickens around and all the stuff going on. So he's been taking her for a real chill 20, 30-minute walk with no commands. <clears throat> oh, he's doing that on the long line, and that's good as gold. Um, and, and, you know, I've talked about this before. People are saying, oh, I'm struggling to give my dog the... Um, enough exercise or, or I was trying to give them a dog freedom sessions but they ended up running around and doing all this bad stuff and it was going to teach them bad habits um, and I've always said just put them on the long line and take them for a massive big walk you know um, just because you walk on the long line you don't need to be hammering out drills and you don't want to do that you don't want to go out and do a training session and do tons and tons of drills over and over and over I, I do it with my dogs I did it with print a lot um, sometimes I take them for a uh, you know, a 40 minute or an hour walk. Um, but whether I did a 15 minute walk or an hour long walk, I'd still only do about five or six stop drills in an hour walk as I would in a 15 minute walk, you know? And um, that's the cool thing about the long line. The rest of the time just walking on the long line. Um, they're not breaking range. If you run into a an, um, distraction, well, I mean, it's not going to be an issue with a nine week old pup, but they're not going to want to be breaking and chasing stuff flat stick. But as a dog gets older um, and you're doing these longer sort of extended training sessions slash walk, um, they're on the long line. They can't come to any grief, you know, so um, now that's fine. Um, Jack's got a 11 or 12 week old H. W. V. Hungarian Y here Vizsla, I'm guessing that is. Created inside the house, struggling to main fa maintain focus on recalls and sits. Progress appears to have stopped, possibly even gone backwards slightly. How would you maintain focus when training, even for short periods? A dog that is not kenneled, but has the run of the house with toys, etc. Any advice appreciated? Also, does anyone have tips on how to keep a pup calm in the house? 
Hi, and someone else has said, hi, Paul, I'm also crating, not kenneling. 12-week-old Brittany he is doing really well. But about a third of the training sessions he spent, most of the sit flop down, burying his nose into the grass. <clears throat> One time he kept bolting. As soon as he did that, he would figure out I'd gone and come after me. Okay, so that's it. We'll, we'll get into that next. Um, Jack. He's got a 11 and a half week old Hungarian wirehead Vizsla that struggles to maintain progress on sits. His progress appears to have stopped, possibly gone backwards. How would you maintain focus when training with a dog that's not kenneled? Any advice appreciated? Also, does anyone hit... Uh, hang on. Sorry, I'm getting bloody confused here. So he's... Uh, long story short, how would you maintain focus when training, even for short periods, a dog that is not kenneled but has the run of the house with toys, etc.? Okay. <laughs> That's the crux of this question. How do I get a dog to maintain focus that has that isn't kenneled and has free run of the house the whole time question is you don't and that's a huge reason why we kennel and that's in the blueprint you know we talk about it at length very seriously because it's very important and this all comes back to the way a pup or dog prioritizes activities and when you know with print print was kenneled a lot and he spent most of his time either in a kennel or on a long line working with me. He got a few relaxed freedom sessions in a controlled environment. But a lot of time in the kennel. And it's very important that your papa dog spends a, at least sort of 30 minutes in a kennel before you train. And again, it comes back to the way your papa dog prioritizes activities. Because if you have a pup, especially an 11 and a half month old pup uh, sorry 11 or 12 week old pup that's got free run of the house with toys everywhere I don't know there may even be other people in the house and kids and um, the pups having all this time free time running around all this excitement and then you're turning up putting a long line on it and asking it to sit you and training and cooperation and the sit drills are a very low priority activity. Pup's getting all this freedom and fun. You put a long line on it, tell it to sit, it's not going to be interested. You have to make training and cooperation with you the pup's highest priority activity and that's a really important part of crating and kenneling during the first 12 months. Once your dog's old at print and fly, it's all set up. And now they spend loads of free time. We go for big free runs out on the beach and they spend a lot of time out of their kennels out in the section out here running and playing. But if you have a pup spending a lot of time in its kennel and then you take it out for a training session and now you're out there and you're working with it, um, interacting with it, doing stop drills, asking it to sit and then praising it when it does, that's a high priority activity. And it'll start listening. And it's just a huge one, man. It's huge. And it's in the blueprint. Um, then that's it. Crating and kindling so important. Um, you know, you have to restrict your papa dog's freedom outside of training. So training is fun for it. I don't, I don't know. You know, I feel like I'm, I'm going to start going round and round in circles on this. It's very basic and simple. And that's why kenneling so important. That's why it's always the first thing that we do. Because people get stuck in a situation. If you don't set up creating a kenneling and you can't do that, and you've got this pup or dog that's just tearing around, wreaking havoc the whole time, and then you can't train it either because it's it's having all that fun and freedom the whole other time. So training's a low priority activity. It's not engaged in training. You can't put it in a kennel. You just it's you get into a very sticky situation with that. So I kept creating a kennel is so important. Get that set up. 
make training a high priority acti- activity early on so the pup or dog's super engaged in that. Then later on, once everything's sorted, the pup or dog can have loads of fun and freedom and you got your control. And it's like the whole basis of what we do. Um, and again, coming back to, you know, in, in the Palmico dog guide, we're trying to drive this home to, to non-hunters is that that crating and kenneling early on is all about setting our dog up so they can have a lot of fun and freedom later on because then they're going to have off-leash control and good recall and I can go through all my training properly so they don't end up scared of stuff or chasing stuff or aggressive or jumping up on other people when they're not told, all of that. So they're a well-mannered dog I can have control of. Now I can take my dogs to the beach and let them off the leash and they can run around and I can call them back if I have to. But they're not out there doing all the stuff I don't want them to do. So now my dogs forever can enjoy loads of fun and freedom. Miko's not even a year old yet. She's already basically there. But if you don't kennel and and then your dog's having all your pups having all this fun and freedom early on, then that negatively affects your training and then you don't have any control. And this is where people end up in a situation where they've got a dog for hunters that they can't take it hunting because it just chases stuff the whole time with pets and socially and in everyday life you can't take it to the park or the beach or wherever because it just runs off and does all sorts of crazy stuff it's got all these bad habits around home it's digging holes and chewing stuff and destroying everything people get into a really sticky situation where they've got a dog that they don't know what to do with and then they're like putting an egg and now they're like man i need to put in a collar in, in a kennel because it's destroying my section it's barking at the neighbours, the council's coming around, getting on my back about it, dog control. And now they're putting the e-collars on it and electrocuting the, the dog. And um, Sometimes dog, dogs end up getting put down and sold and passed on and poorly treated and all this stuff, you know, and end up having a, 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 you know, a negative life forever just because you're trying to give it a little bit more freedom early on you know it's like very counterintuitive it's like lock them up now and have them on a leash now so they can be out of the kennel and off leash later on um it's a really important sort of idea to grasp and and um it can have a huge positive payoff for for dog owners and the dog you know it's about what's doing best for the dog in the long run and 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 it comes from, you know, it's it can be really well intended to give a pup or dog loads of freedom. No, I don't want to lock it up. Or I want to take it and let it off the leash early. But man, it can cost you and the dog a lot later on. So, And that's why the Deer Dog Training Blueprint and the Palmico Dog Guide is the way they are. It's all designed to avoid all of that stuff. Um, you know, when I first started training dogs, my whole job was fixing dogs that had been given that hadn't been kenneled and hadn't been trained and had and been let off the long line or the lead too early like that was the whole thing and it was serious problems um and dogs like looking down the barrel of being put down and stuff that's why it is the way it is um and then by the time our dog's a year old all of that stuff's dealt with and they can have all this fun and freedom um super important Um, Cyrus Richardson <clears throat> Cyrus is also crating not kindling crating's fine um, she's crating a 12 week old Brittany he's doing really well about a third of the training sessions he spends most oh yeah, back to this one most of us sit flop down bearing his nose into the grass one time he kept bolting Oh, one time I kept bolting as he did that. He would figure out I'd gone and come after me. Yeah, that's no good. After a while, he became more watchful of where I was, but it's pretty tiring. Any advice on how to maintain his attentiveness on me? So 
um, you know, we, we talk about that in the blueprint too, um, but getting your, and in the Palmico dog guide, getting your dog nice and steady on the stop. Like, I mean, first of all, 12 weeks old, um, it's still a young pup, you know. Um, yeah, he's a young pup. 12 weeks old, so so you're not wanting to be perfect at this stage. But I'll just correct it. And, and things like um, eat, eating grass and wriggling and shifting weight, we've just made some videos in the Pal Miko dog guide. Miko was, as I walked, I put her on a stop and walk around the back of her, she'd shift her weight, wriggle from side to side and turn to watch me. So she'd look at, look, be watching me over one shoulder. And as I walked around, she'd shift her whole weight and turn right around to watch me. Um, other things is, you know, wriggling around, eating grass, pawing at stuff. Um, all of that is a precursor to getting up off the stop or the stop not being that good. And, and so again, it's just, um, pressure on what you don't want, praise on what you do want and reading and timing and correcting the thought, you know, as soon as the, if you say sit and your pup sits down and looks up at you. As soon as they look down at the grass, and you don't have to always give a check on the long line or step right in or do anything. It's, it's put pressure on what you don't want, praise on what you do want, and all it's always the minimum amount of pressure or praise required to get the job done. So in the case of say, having a pup on the sit and it looking down and beginning to eat grass, Instead of waiting for it to really start eating grass and then getting up and moving around and then stepping in, putting it back on the sit, having a touch and all of that, you're better off as soon as it looks down, say up. And if as soon as it looks back up again, good dog. So pressure on looking down, praise on looking back up and then move around, keep that eye contact, try to hold it even for a couple of seconds, step back in, give it a pat step back if it looks down again up if it looks back up good dog step back and praise it step back and try to and get eye contact to release it um but that's it is, is really and and often with a pup when you're trying to get your stop drills going early on i'll i'll be looking for even just one or two seconds, if a pup's super distracted all over the place, eating grass, all of that, I'm trying to go, you know, with Miko, I'm trying to go, Miko, sit. And then hopefully she sits. If she doesn't, I'll step in and push, gently push her bum down. Step back. I'm trying to get it. If she looks, if a pup's super distracted, not looking at me at all, if I step back and click my fingers or take a step, to the side and that pup looks up at me just as soon as it makes eye contact I'll go good dog and step in and give her a pat and then step back as she looks down to eat the grass I'll go up take another step to the side trying to get her attention as soon as she looks back up step in give her a pat step back try to get eye contact as soon as she looks up I'll release it because that release is a big huge thing that gets eye contact is trying to get the dog to look to you before you release it off the stop. <clears throat> as soon as the dog realizes, oh, I don't get released unless I look up, you end up with this dog just staring at you as you're walking around it in circles, waiting for that release. And it's also praising eye contact too. And that can be anything from just saying good girl while you're walking around. You could say it from a few meters away. Um, to stepping right back in and giving them a pat for for holding eye contact but that would be my advice there is just really fine tuning all of those things looking for one or two seconds at a time um and and one step back at a time you know what i mean and then get that really small steps getting your pup sitting take one step back the second it makes eye contact praise it and give it a pat step back again if it looks back up release it one or two seconds at a time and one or two steps at a time and just try to slowly build simon 
Tia is the same age as Miko. And a Vizsla heading dog cross. Got her from the South Island. Everything was going well up until a month ago. With a very good stop out to 50 or 60 metres. It's quite a long way. Um, I'd finished the clapper training. Then she wouldn't stay stopped. Couldn't move one step without her moving two. Think she may have been getting bored of training. <clears throat> She will sit and stay at the kennel waiting to go in at dinner time or the truck, but not in the field. Spent the last month trying to retrain, but some days I get one or five meters. Also about the same time, she has started to sometimes nip, snap as I give her a pat. The only way is to put the other hand on the chin, okay? First thing, um, we showed you that trick in the blueprint. If a dog starts getting up off the stop like that, um, tie a loop in your long line and peg the dog to the ground. You know, and it just comes back training for success, not letting the dog fail. Um, if the dog starts getting off the stop, that's one just 100% fail proof way. To get the dog staying there again and then you can carry out <clears throat> um, quite a few drills like that where the dog can't get up and then you can even take um, and then you can take the peg away you know that can be a really good one um, but another thing is if you're going 50 60 meters away um, and running into issues you need to bring your your range right back in and just not go so far away um, yeah just come right back to basics, man. And, and it's that idea of um, if you start running into trouble in training, just take a step right back. Um, figuratively speaking, take a step um, back in training, go back to basics, start retraining again, and, and just try, set the dog up so it can't get it wrong. Peg it to the spot if it's getting up off the stop um, and work on that. Um, that nipping... That can be a couple of things. It can be the dog showing you it's a little bit anxious, it's getting bored and anxious and you're doing a little bit too much or you're doing the same stuff over and over again. Um, it's also the dog's not necessarily taking you 100% seriously, man. I, I, I'm very firm with that sort of stuff. Like a dog, even if a dog playfully jumps up and has like a little nip, I'm like, ah, cut it out. Like my tone is very, what the hell do you think you're doing? Like none of that. Um, very firm on it, and and um, and yeah, yeah, just correct it, and I'd be check on the long line, and just not put up with any of it because that that's a really telling thing for me. I've seen it in one on ones quite a bit. Uh, people are having trouble with their dogs, and um, their dog does that. It's jumping up and nipping at them, and all of that. Um. Sometimes it's just a case of just being firmer. And and often a handle like that is very cruisy with the dog. Um, you know, they're very um, soft and spongy with their commands. That Their whole tone is slow and cruisy. And the dog is, is um, you know, trying to talk back a little bit and seeing how much can I get away with this guy. You're not meeting the dog at, a, at an intense enough level. And... and you just need to come in with more intensity. Hey, cut that out. You know, give it a check on the long line. Um, and and but you always need to balance that with praise on the other end. You know, you anytime you're you're trying to um, correct something like that, like a dog um, jumping up and nipping or getting up off the stop or anything like that, you're always saying, "Hey, cut that out." Pressure on what you don't want, and and. The whole aim of that is to divert the dog to doing the thing that you do want and then praising that. You're always trying to show them. You know, you never want to just say, hey, don't do that. Don't do that. Because that can create anxiety in itself where the dog's trying to work out what to do and all you're doing is saying, don't do that. But you're not giving that, them that alternative. It's really important to say, hey, don't do that. So in the case of her nipping at your hand, say, ah, check it, cut that out. And then trying to get a hand back in there 
like you say, holding her chin and saying, good girl, as soon as she's letting you pat her without nipping at you. Aaron. Hi, Paul. Still having slight issues with Seeker anticipating the shot. Put him on a stop and have to reset him three or four times before he'll stay sitting through the entire drill. Only does it with only does it with gun. Any thoughts? Only got to shooting an open ear, not over the top of him yet. With a twenty two. Heading dog one on one before Christmas. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I, I remember, remember you, mate. Remember that one-on-one. -on -one. Um, okay. So he's putting him on a stop. He's pretty good at the stops, but with the gun, he's getting up off the stop. Um, man, that trick from the blueprint, tying a loop in the long line and pegging him to the spot. Um, making sure it's not, and, and that would be good to know, it's actually very important here, um, when he's getting up, is he shying away from the gun, and un, not sure about it, I'm pretty sure I know, I'm pretty sure he's, um, he's not shying away, he's not telling, he's not getting up trying to move away from the gun, but you know, looking like gun shy, he's getting up, he's excited, anticipating the shot, wondering what's going on, um, in that case, I would peg him to the spot and get him to stay if he's excited and anticipating that shot, wanting to get up and do something and investigate it. I'd go straight to that peg so he can't get up. Um, I'd even go back to the clapper. Um, and same thing, if, if you're stepping back and shooting and he's getting up and things, I just can't bring my range right back in. So, you know, if you're saying sit, and then walking away 20 metres and trying to fire a shot, then I would go back to the clapper, make him sit and walk away 2 metres and clap. And then if he gets up, you're right next to him, and you can say, up, sit back down, and then come back another 2 metres, clap. If he stays sitting down, step back in, give him a pat. So it's just bring all the parameters right back in and make it as easy as you can. It's that same thing. If you ever run into trouble in training, you take backward steps go back in time, back down the line, and work on the things, get your foundation more solid, you know, get your, um, the steps, the previous steps more solid before you move on, um, just take steps back, you know, and if he's getting up off the sit, then maybe your sit's not as good as it could be, so, um, that would be my advice there, you know, I'm not saying, you know, and, and, and you want to be careful here, if you're doing gunfire work and your dog's getting up off the stop and it's not sure, don't just peg it to the spot and keep shooting, you want to be very careful of that, that but that is a tool that if your dog's excited and your sit's really good and it keeps getting up when you're shooting, you can tie that loop in the long line, you know, two feet away from the dog's neck, um, use a fence standard, peg the dog to the ground, so if they do get up, they just get stopped by the long line. It's just like you're tying the dog up. Um, and do a whole heap with those until the dog's just used to the fact, you, again, you're just eliminating all, you're setting the dog up for success, you're setting it up so it can't get it wrong. Um, and and just do it till it's boring, you know. But if he's if he's showing that he's he's scared of the gun, then that's a whole complete different thing, you know. And you want to go right back to your clapper training and all of that. Um, but yeah, that's my advice on that. I would um, go right back, right back to get making sure my sits really good. Then I would go back to a clapper, um, nice and close, so I can correct him as soon as he gets up. Try to work incrementally away from him with that if he, if that doesn't work and, it, and it's this real sticking point when you are further away from him and you're firing the gun 
and he's confident with the gun and its excitement, then I just peg him to the spot and work on it like that. Oh, Aaron's saying he's coming towards me, not scared. Yeah. Yep. So, um, I'll just do that, man. Um, yeah, and I thought that it'd be that, Aaron, because I remember he was quite a he was quite a confident dude, um, strutting around with his tail up, super confident. Um, if anything, you know, he just you you needed to be firmer with him with a lot of things. Um, so that would be one thing. Um, making sure that you he's taking you seriously enough, that you're being firm on him, that your stop is good enough. Um, even being really firm with him when he does get up when you fire a shot, or otherwise just that peg trick works good, man. And just do that over and over until he's bored with it and then take the peg away. Later on, you should be good. Jonathan Griff, how's it going, mate? Uh, when I'm about to train Tui, if she's inside in her cage, I'd let her out for a quick loo stop, quick run around, then I'd take her for a training session once back. Hang on. Uh, Jonathan Griff. When I'm about to train Tui, if she's inside in her cage, I'd let her out for a quick loo stop, quick run about, then I'd take her for a training session once back. <laughs> I don't know. I think that might actually be... Uh, um, answering someone else another question that I was talking about earlier or something um, Luke saying thanks for your answer I'll just keep doing what I'm doing um, someone said something about an answer to a To a post they made ages ago or a few days ago Dylan Grant, hi Paul, my lab pup is four and a half months old on part three. He's doing well but tends to sprint to get in front on a turn and sprint after a stop to a point out in front and then slow down. Is this something to worry about or will he grow out of it and naturally slow down? Four and a half months old, um... On part three of the blueprint, I wouldn't worry about it too much at this point, mate. Um, yeah, you know, part five, six, seven, eight of the blueprint. And really, um, part seven and eight is where you really start slowing everything down and pulling all your range and speed and everything together. So if you're on part three, you know, at this point, and, and you're saying he... he um, runs out to a point in front and then slows down, that's good. He's he's getting all the patterns together and knows where his range is and he knows the turns and he's, he knows his go. So um, I wouldn't worry about it at this stage. Um, I wouldn't put any undue pressure or, or you know start growling him and all that. If he's listening to commands but just moving a bit quick um, at four and a half months old, that's fine. And I think as you keep working your way through, you get later on... Um, we go right into it, man, on how to slow all that stuff right down. Yeah. Oh, guys, is there any more questions here? I know there's heaps further down. 
Um, I know there's been lots of posts and stuff talked about, but there's been lots of good answers. I haven't really seen anything. Um, that hasn't been um, sort of well spoken about or answered. And um, I guess I really need to have a little talk about this too, guys, about, you know, we're just getting super busy um, with, uh, you know, obviously Big Game Indicating Dogs, the Deer Dog Training Blueprint. We've got the Palmico Dog Guide and Palmico Dog Training and <clears throat> um, working on these Q&As and the podcast. And um, it's all really good stuff. But we are getting really busy and um, it is getting to the point where I'm struggling to keep up with comments and messages um, and questions and all of that. And even the, the big game indicating dogs in a circle, I'm struggling to keep up with um, all of the posts and comments and answering all of that. Um, I've actually got a new guy starting um, soon that's going to help with sort of managing all this sort of stuff but this is really why we started these um, inner circles and why we started these Q&As and so yeah I really just need people to try as much as they can to to put their questions on the Q&A posts in the inner circle so everything's all in one place um, so I can come here do a live Q&A I can go through the comments that are on that post that are saying, um, you know, it says live Q&A. And what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to start one straight away um, saying that this is the post in the inner circle for the next live Q&A. And we'll let you know later on when it's going to be. But there'll be a post there that you can ask your questions on to be answered in the next Q&A straight away. So it's all in the same place because it's... Um, it's there's just a lot going on guys um and and like i say it's all cool stuff it's it's really awesome and we're stoked to be doing it but um we've got to keep things organized you know because it can get a bit scrambled and all over the place um and it's hard to keep up with and and we sort of want to do as good a job as we can um and we need you guys to help with that too by um getting those questions all in the same place so I'll start that post in the inner circle um, now, as soon as we sort of finish this Q&A. Right, I think that's all the questions, is it? We're going to have, I'm going to have a bit of a break. Um, we've been tapped out for so long. We've been tapped out for, I've been pretty tapped out for like three years. Um, but this last year, uh, well, the last 10 months just been really flat out. Um, we went straight through Christmas and made the Palmico dog guy. We're still going on that. We've been flat out with the blueprint. We started the podcast, which that was like a huge like thing of growth and learning and all this new stuff and getting guests in. And, um, um, we actually had a couple of podcasts lined up to do, but I, I said, I sort of put them off until February um henry's got to take off for a break and i've got a new guy starting in february um just so much going on so um yeah we're probably gonna just shut down the podcasts and the q a's for the next two weeks um and start back in early february and just have to have a quick break and come back fresh with a new plan i've got some um really cool guests lined up for the podcast in February heaps of cool plans for the blueprint um, the pal Miko dog guides going really well um, heaps of cool stuff with Miko there I was doing retrieve work with her recently that's going in the pal Miko dog guide um, and she's just about sort of going off leash um, out in public and stuff everything's just going really well there um yeah, just heaps going on, guys. So um, we're going to have a bit of a regroup and be back on deck better than ever in February. <laughs> 